You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. My guest today, this morning, is Brian Hope, founder of Sustainable Vine Wine Tours in Santa Barbara. And welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you, Jill, and thank you for inviting me into this lovely studio this morning. I know it is. It isn't it very comfortable at KCSB? It is. Is this the first time you've done a radio interview sitting on a couch? On a couch, it is. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, Brian, w- today will be enlightening us about the differences between organic or biodynamically grown wine and conventional wine, and why it's important to support your local vintner. And Brian has been involved in sustainability issues for many years. His career path has included working for Patagonia and promoting and installing vending machines that dispense healthy snacks and also healthy food distribution in schools. Brian's also worked in the solar power and eco-tour industries. He's a lead leadership in energy and environmental design accredited consultant. And Brian also graduated from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1996 with degrees in geography and environmental studies. So Brian, this was kind of, you came, this was like coming back home today, walking across campus. Absolutely. Brought back some uh, memories, some good, and uh, some a little scary. Were some of them, did some of them involve drinking wine? They did. I actually took a wine tasting class here at UCSB. And uh, at the time, I had no idea that I would be doing what I'm doing now. It was more or less an excuse just to kind of, uh, you know, get buzzed (laughs) midweek. And so now you actually are professionally involving getting other people buzzed in a way, but on organic wine, it's wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. So what drove you to drinking organic and biodynamically grown wine? What drove me to drinking? <laughs> uh, actually, um, the way it all started, it, it, the business has only been in operation for about a year. You know, the idea came about pretty quickly and then uh, basically just went for it. And uh, more or less, uh, it, was, it was due to the Sanfords, mostly. Uh, they're, you know, legendary grape growers and winemakers in the San Ynez Valley. And uh, Richard and uh, Teclan Sanford have been at it for so long and have been doing it organically, you know, from the beginning. And the more I learned about their story and and what they were doing, the more I realized, wow, this is very cool. And and there may be other people doing the same thing. And the more I researched, the more I realized, wow, this is uh, really happening. And, uh, you know, there is enough action, enough people to create an experience, to create a tour. And that it's pretty amazing that it, would you say that a lot of growers in the San Ynez Valley are are starting to um, grow organically, or is it still a fairly small portion of growers? There are quite a few people that are that are going to organic or some form of sustainable agriculture uh, when it comes to grape growing. Uh, you know, there are some people that promote it and, and talk about it, and there are others uh, there are others that uh, are just kind of quietly going about their business and implementing uh, things like you know cover crops and owl boxes and some other things that we may get into in a little bit. That is great. Well, Brian, let's start. Tell us about um, Sustainable Vine Wine Tours and what a typical tour, what would someone experience going on this trip? Well, hopefully they don't break any laws. Um, That's kind of a a goal to have fun and and stay within the boundaries of uh, legality. But um, what we do is we do door-to-door transportation. So we pick you up in Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Inez, in this area because we don't want anyone uh, driving Um, and what we do is we use a a 10 passenger Mercedes Sprinter van. I saw you pull up in that this morning I was very impressed. Well thank you. Yeah it's definitely large and in charge Uh, but uh, what we do is we do door-to-door transportations we pick you up and uh, typically we visit three to sometimes four different uh, wineries and vineyards. So we try and create an experience where you're you know, obviously tasting good wine, but you're also, when possible, you know, meeting the winemaker, uh, the grower, 
um, kind of experiencing, you know, that aspect. So it's not just a tasting room tour. It's a tour where you're actually learning and, uh, you know, drinking all, along the way. And actually seeing the connection between the plants, it sounds like you're, you're actually getting to see how the wine is grown as well. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, another part of the tour includes a, a lunch we try and do in a, in a vineyard, uh, typically a very private setting. It's um, kind of off the beaten path with uh, you know, San Ynez Mountains as the backdrop. It's, uh, it's a great experience. And then we you know, taste some more after lunch and then, and then head back. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that Tecla and I, I know Tecla. What is her husband's name? Richard. Richard. Mm-hmm. Richard. The Sanfords had an influence on you. But how did you, was it from them that you got the idea for sustainable vine? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then also, you know, of course, with the movie Sideways and the popularity and, you know, the buzz a- about the area, uh, I knew that there were more and more people coming to the area uh, specifically to taste wine and and see what Santa Barbara had to offer. So kind of that and, uh, you know, seeing what some of these growers were doing and and realizing that, you know, people wanted to support uh, growers that are farming, uh, you know, lighter on the land. Now, what has been the reaction to the people on your tour to seeing how this wine is grown? Were they surprised? Yeah, they're blown away because it, it basically what we try and do is kind of demystify the whole process because people, you know, it's, it's like uh, any agricultural product you know you go to the store and you you pick up whatever it is you need and walk out the door and uh, people don't really understand you know what goes into it the amount of labor the amount of cost um, you know if you're farming conventionally the amount of uh, sprays and chemicals and that sort of thing so what we really try and do is is give people an understanding so they walk away at the end of the day going well okay now I, I kind of understand you know that bottle of wine that I bought you know what went into it and and they appreciate it a little bit more so tell us what are some of the um, stops along the way on some of your tours. Okay, well, um, as mentioned earlier, Almarosa. Well, actually, I don't think I did mention Almarosa. That was uh, the label that uh, Richard and Tecla are now uh, a part of. So Almarosa, Ampelos, Beckman, Demetria, Presidio, and Sunstone are, are the stops that we're making now uh, with uh, the hopes that that will expand. There are more and more growers that are farming uh, organically or biodynamically or sustainably. So hopefully that list uh, grows next year. Could you tell, um, some listeners may not know what biodynamic farming is. Could you give us a brief intro to that? Sure, yeah. Biodynamics is a system of farming that was uh, originated by a guy named Rudolf Steiner in the 1920s. He's a Austrian, or was an Austrian, and he was kind of a Renaissance guy. He had different ideas about education, uh, economics, uh, farming. Uh, one of the things uh, that he's probably best known for is the Waldorf School here in America. Everyone knows that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't know about biodynamics or, or the fact that he was the uh, kind of the originator of that. But uh, in the 1920s, he wrote a series of lectures about agriculture and the way things were changing. And, and his ideas were to kind of bring it back more in line with nature so that things were um, balanced and that, uh, you know, a system where you're working with nature, not against nature. Mm-hmm. And so is that a set, did he, did he give like a set of guidelines for farmers to follow? He did, yes, and, and that's a great point, that originally it was designed, well actually it still is, for agriculture in general. And nowadays it seems that uh, Grape growers have really embraced this system and have felt that it really works well for grape growing. And so it's uh, becoming really common. Well, it's common in Europe, and it's becoming more and more common, actually, in in the United States as well. And, uh, you know, proof of that is certainly in the fact that uh, Wine Spectator, which is one of the leading uh, wine publications uh, this last year, put out, an issue w- where the cover story was wine goes green and it talked all about the different uh, winemakers in the US that are embracing uh, these you know styles of sustainable agriculture. Now Brian you've had experience at, uh, with drinking or all of us I think I don't think I've had organic wine maybe once can you tell the difference in taste at all? Yeah, I'm not a uh, that's a great point because there there is a difference and and there's confusion about what organic wine actually is. Um, the USDA, when they took over the organic certification, and I believe it was 2002, 
um, determined that wine was only organic if you did not add additional sulfites to the wine in addition to farming the grapes organically, which farming them organically means you can't add you know, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. But on top of that, you can't add additional sulfites. Even though they naturally occur in the wine, uh, most winemakers will add additional sulfites because it allows the wine to age properly. It stabilizes the wine. So under the organic certification, you can't do that. So most uh, winemakers that want to, you know, farm or, or make what you would, I guess, generally call organic wine are making wines made from organically grown grapes. They want to add the sulfites because they want the wines to age properly. They want them to taste better. Uh, they want to make a, a quality product. And personally, I haven't tried an organic wine under the USDA guidelines that I preferred. So the USDA guidelines, it, sometimes it seems like those backfire a bit. Certainly, yes. <laughs> it seems like when the USDA gets involved, things start to go downhill. The man. Yeah. <laughs> and the one woman, Condoleezza Wright. Well, she's yeah. not involved in that. Okay. Um, anyway, so tell, so Brian, what would one question I had was I'm wondering what the difference is if I was driving by a vineyard and um, or driving by a, a, I guess, what do you call the place where the yeah. grapes are? <laughs> the vineyard. vineyard yeah. um, would I be able to tell the difference off the, right off the bat between maybe a biodynamic vineyard and a conventional? Yeah, there's definitely ways that you can tell. Um, well, biodynamic, yeah, sustainable, I guess you could say. Uh, a couple of the key things that would, would indicate that would be uh, probably the most obvious would be cover cropping. So what a lot of growers are starting to do is plant uh, different plants between the rows of uh, vines. Uh, historically, people tried to keep that understory, you know, perfectly clean without it any weeds. stripped. Yeah, it's completely yeah. stripped, you know, t- not much uh, diversity going on. But now it's becoming popular to plant different species of uh, legumes, uh, nitrogen-rich uh, beans like fava beans and purple vetch and sweet pea between the rows that is then mowed and then tilled back into the soil, and it acts as a natural fertilizer. So if you were to drive along you know, one of the roads in the San Ynez Valley and see things growing between the rows, you know, like a rich green crop, then you would know that, okay, yeah, they're practicing some degree of uh, sustainability. Another uh, key uh, telltale would be owl boxes. So a lot of growers now are, are placing owl boxes to encourage owls to nest along the uh, vineyards, and what that does is it basically is a natural um, ground squirrel uh, deterrent. So uh-huh. they feed on ground squirrels in the evening, so and ground squirrels can disrupt the, the root system. So, so what will the ground squirrels? They will um, disrupt the root systems of the the grapes of the themselves. vines. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. they're yeah. kind Weak of tunneling the in there. Exactly. And so the owls are actually um, a natural pest. Well, not pest animal. Rodent control. Rodent control. Guess, yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's great. And now, what do most? Do you know what conventional vineyards do in that case? I wonder. Uh, they a lot of times they'll trap or they'll put out poisons, um, but yeah, it's. Yeah, much more sustainable to do the owls. Absolutely. Now, now Brian, tell us a bit too about. Um, Another, maybe another difference we might notice between a sustainable vineyard and, and maybe also if you could tell our listeners, what is a conventional vineyard? When we're, someone might not know what that term is. Conventional, which is it's kind of ironic, uh, is now, well, the norm, you know, mm-hmm. using all the synthetic uh, pesticides and fertilizers. Um, after World War II and the whole chemical revolution, uh, it became popular to use uh, various fertilizers and sprays and, and different things to to control nature and um, you know a lot of these are synthetic and can really affect the groundwater and you know they're airborne a lot of times and so they can affect uh, human health as well Uh, but conventional is a system where you're basically you're fertilizing to get everything to grow and then you're you know if you have an insect problem then you're killing off not just the insect that you don't want but you're killing off all insects so it's kind of this uh, extreme style of farming where everything's you know out of natural balance that you're you know farming one thing and you know it, it's just kind of an awkward system that has surprisingly become kind of the norm which re- it's it's pretty amazing huh yeah but I think it's so dependent on the petroleum pesticides, petroleum-based pesticides. Absolutely. And, and your chemical salesman that comes and, you know, sells you this and sells you that. And then 
sells you something else because what you just put on has affected you know this you know it's it's this kind of vicious cycle that uh, doesn't seem to end it's kind of like plants on prescription drugs absolutely like the side effects yeah now is it more expensive for vintners to grow um, more sustainably do you know it is yeah for for organic for example I know uh, Richard Sanford has has mentioned that it costs about five percent more to farm organically and uh, you know to most people that's pretty negligible and, and worth the you know potential risks of using pesticides you, know, you don't think about uh, you know, your workers and the liability with that or you know the groundwater and you know the potential that you, you know might screw that up you know there's there's a lot of of costs that aren't calculated you know it seems like when we calculate things we do it on the mighty dollar and we don't think about these other things that you know may not be a direct result but eventually will mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, very serious results sometimes mm-hmm. too and brian let's talk a bit more in depth about biodynamically grown wine yeah as i mentioned uh, earlier uh, it was a system started by a gentleman named rudolf steiner who developed this system uh, to farm more in harmony with nature and um, like i was saying that now it's really being embraced by by grape growers and uh, winemakers um, but to talk a little bit more in depth about biodynamics it's it's uh, a system that you know can sound kind of freakish to some people because there are some kind of you know way out there aspects of it like digging holes and like i <laughs> yes bur- bur- burying cow horn yeah, packed exactly. with manure when yeah. i lived in hawaii there was a farmer that practiced that uh-huh. and um but his his produce and to me it, it didn't it made a lot of sense i just remember the digging the hole part i was a little like hmm yeah, <laughs> and yeah. whatever yeah which is a great i mean it's a great point that <laughs> that there are there are a lot of people that that are you know a little bit alternative that are that are embracing this uh, method but there are also the mainstream people that have experimented and are now coming to this from a different perspective from a perspective that this works very well that it's that it's you know the best way that they know to achieve the results, you know, the quality results, which, you know, winemaking is all about results. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a style of, of farming that they say can really result in a sense of terroir or a sense of place, you know, because winemakers really want to exhibit wines that are unique, that have a certain, you know, characteristic of that particular spot, of that soil, of that climate, you know, of, of that you know, everything that goes into it, all of the natural components. And by farming biodynamically, they feel that it really kind of hones in on on those aspects, that there isn't, you know, other things that are kind of muddling up, um, you know, what those tastes could potentially be. And what are some of the practices that you've seen or some of the different different things that biodynamic (coughs) farmers do with um, grapes? Well, it, biodynamics mostly deals with uh, the vines and or the the grapes in the vineyard. Uh, you know, like I was saying before, the cover crop that's that's a huge part of it. Uh, but you know, more or less, it's it's a system where you're trying to create healthy soils. You want you know diversity. You want microorganisms that are going to help break down the soils. You're you're not artificially enhancing it. You know, you're not throwing a bunch of, of chemicals there to to artificially uh, you know. Like steroids, like almost. exactly, yeah. exactly. It's it's perfectly you know in line with that aspect that you know you see these conventional vineyards sometimes they look amazing you know they're they're huge they're you know vibrant but it's like the guy on steroids you know is that guy really that healthy you know ultimately it's it's going to be a crash situation um, but with biodynamics like we were talking about it's all about creating healthy soils because if you have a healthy soil then you're going to have healthy vines. If you have healthy vines, then those vines are naturally going to resist uh, disease and insects and predation, that sort of thing. You know, just like the human, human body is the same way. Mm-hmm. Your roots, try and get your, your inside, your bo- your foundation healthy. Exactly, yeah, your core, into the core, yeah. Now, does biodynamic too, I've read a bit about it in the past, um, involve kind of working with the phases of the moon and the is, isn't that a large part of it? It is, yes. It's, it's uh, you know, to some people it sounds kind of freaky that, you know, you're, you're following this calendar that uh, deals with the moon phases and where the astrological, you know, signs are within the phases. But if you kind of break it down and think about it in, in terms of farmer's almanac, you know, people have been following the farmer's almanac 
for centuries and and no one has issue with that you know that's like oh okay polymer's almanac but you know you talk talk about uh, biodynamic uh, moon phases and people kind of whoa they you kind of freak out on that but you know it's it's basically a system where you're you're you know following these these systems these phases so that you know when to plant when to prune when to harvest when to pick you know all all the different things and it makes sense you know it's it's not uh not outlandish you know the proofs in the pudding or wine i guess the, the glass of in the wine. glass yeah. <laughs> now have you did you, had you heard of biodynamic farming before you began this business i didn't i had no idea what it was and when i first heard about it i was i was kind of blown away and and when i first started doing the tours i was i was very hesitant about what i would tell people you know because to the average person you start talking about you know this as well as some other things i'll talk about and and they just don't they don't get it they're like wow this how could this be any good you know and these guys are weird uh, but in, in one of the parts of that that kind of blows people away is this this concept of ashing so they'll take a a pest um, say a ground squirrel and they'll take some uh, dead ground squirrels and they'll burn them they'll char them and then turn that into a a spray um, very low dosage spray and spray that out throughout the vineyard and what that basically does is, uh, That's I guess... a pretty strong message to other grounds. It is. It's kind of like <laughs> bad juju, you know. It's, it's almost voodoo, you know, to some people. But, you know, going back to the proof, there, there's a, a grower in the valley, um, Beckman. Uh, Steve Beckman's a, a huge proponent of biodynamics, and he's experimented with this and apparently gets very good results. So, you know, it's... You have to kind of... You know, a lot of this biodynamic stuff is is not explainable by our, you know, natural systems of, of science. You know, you have to kind of think outside the box to some degree. But, you know, like I keep going back, it's, it's you know, the proof is there. And, and well, It kind of makes sense with, um, it's almost like a homeopathic. I've heard of people putting um, large animal. When I worked in an organic farm, an heirloom nursery, we would bag up zoo poo. That was one of my more illustrious careers. Mm-hmm. I was a zoo poo bagger, mm-hmm. and we would sell it all around the world to people that would actually place it in their garden and right. yard, and supposedly it would warn off, you know, smaller animals. Right. <laughs> tiger poop? It would smell tiger poop in Santa yeah. Barbara. Wow. Yeah. It's intense. <laughs> um, but it reminded me of that a little bit. Yeah. And you're talking about the, the homeopathic uh, side of things, and, and there are other sprays that they use in the vineyard, uh, things like um, horn silica and yarrow and um, chamomile and and what they basically do they're all natural um, components that are sprayed throughout the vineyard during different times of the growing season and they act as like homeopathic medicine they're just little signals to the plant that hey okay you may want to focus on this or you may need a little bit of that Uh, you know going back to creating this system that is naturally healthy now, what with the plants, would they make like a almost like a tea of them, or what do they do? Yes, it, it is. It's a tea that's made, and you and you store these different um, components in a um, peat moss box that you know is is protected from you know negative energies and, and that sort of thing. And then when you create these teas, you have to stir them a certain way with you know intention and positive energy, and um, you know so there's there's definitely some some uh, interesting aspects to biodynamics, but. You know, it's just more or less a way of farming the way people farm prior to a uh, chemical revolution. You know, mm-hmm. the way people, kind of an old school style of farming. Well, it sounds like a more holistic way. It is, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Do you know any other biodynamic practices? It's interesting to hear about them. Uh, the cover cropping is 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 big. Um, the sprays, the different sprays are big. Uh, the, you know, n- not using synthetics so so basically when you're bio, farming biodynamically you're also um, by nature also organic mm-hmm. because you can't use the sprays that you would use it, you know it, it's the same i wonder how rudolf steiner came up with this system just by observation and uh, maybe he was yeah. um you know taken by some aliens that yeah. showed him a de- you know better way i don't or know or fungi or yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you know what's funny is I tease about this and joke, but I actually do um, find it. I, I be, be, not believe in it, but I yeah. have read a lot about it, and I think it, it's pretty amazing. The one thing, what about the cow head? The cow head. I don't. <laughs> it, was the it cow, cow horns? There's or cow something? horns. Yes, and there's cow <laughs> horns that you, you have to take a cow horn. I think it has to have, have had one 
um, calf it has to be treated organically, the cow. And then you take the cow horn and you pack it I'm with manure. I'm glad it's manure. the horn. Okay. Yeah. And then you, you bury that horn uh, facing a certain direction uh, for like a certain amount of time. And then you unearth it. You make your tea. And uh, yeah, it, it, a lot of it has to do with energies. You don't you drink know. the tea from the horn. You, d- you know, okay. you do not. No, none of this is for <laughs> human consumption. Uh, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, like putting stuff in, in bladders of animals and that sort of thing. It's, it's uh, you know, some people may look at it as kind of, you know, witchcrafty, but, uh, you know, I don't know. It's people. It sounds like how almost like the old way of farming. It is. Yes. Yeah. It's very much an old way of, of farming. And. You know, you don't have to do all that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. there's certain degrees of this. And, you know, some people are, are embracing more or less the things that make sense to them. You know, so they think, well, you know, the ashing, that I, I, I can't see how that would work. So I'm not going to implement that, which is fine. You know, there are, you know, as many people as there are farming biodynamically, there are that many different, you know, systems of it. You know, well, so. I remember in Hawaii, this, these people I knew had a farm that was pretty small and their yield was incredible. And they were biodynamic farmers. And mm-hmm. that was when I first heard about it. Mm hmm. And it was pretty uh, incredible food. Yeah. And very amazing produce. Well, the wines, they're, you know, they speak for themselves. They're outstanding. You were mentioning how you learned about biodynamic farming from um, your Sustainable Vine wine tours. When I, I was struck by when I was reading your bio online or just in an article about you, I think that was in a, a magazine or newspaper. You've done quite a lot of different things, but they all had a common thread of kind of environmental stewardship and wanting to take care of the earth. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a bit about your past and how you uh, you came to um, doing this business? Yeah, when when I grew up, uh, my parents were big, uh, you know, advocates of the family garden. So we grew up with, uh, you know, eating fresh vegetables out of the garden, which I think had a huge impact on on, you know, my philosophies and, and the direction that I went. Um, you know, we were also big into, you know, backpacking and kind of being in nature. So that was also a, a part of it. And then when I came here to uh, UCSB, uh, you know, I, I, I followed a path that um, I thought would allow me to work in those fields that would, you know, help me to pursue careers that would help to preserve nature and to, you know, work with it and, and, uh, and through that, uh, basically, I've I've uh, had a number of, of jobs where I've been involved with you know, you know either preservation of, of natural areas or you know like for example Patagonia you know everyone knows about Patagonia and the great things that Yvonne Chouinard has done and I think he was a you know instrumental person as well in, in giving me this idea of you know how business could be green and and the direction that uh, you could go in that regard you know with his 1% one percent for the planet and and all the great things that he's done um and then i've also uh i've been involved with uh, vending machines and putting healthy foods in vending machines and then working with schools and trying to get the junk food out of schools and you know, so it's Which just you did quite a while ago right that you was were ahead yeah. of your time in that area that was yeah that was in uh 2001 i was actually at the uh LA Unified School Board meeting when they uh, decided to ban uh, Coke and Pepsi, which was a huge landmark uh, moment. I bet they lost funding on that one. Uh, Yeah, it was uh, pretty intense. There were a lot of uh, attorneys um, yelling and screaming, that's for sure. And then uh, more recently in the green building um, industry, I uh, work for a uh, local retailer here in town, uh, Living Green, selling green building materials uh, with uh, yours truly. And um, that gave me, you know, insights into, you know, how much energy goes into homes and and that whole aspect. Uh, and then became uh, lead accredited and uh, wanted to pursue, you know, green building. And, uh, and then I realized, wow, okay, there's not a lot of building going on in Santa Barbara. And, uh, you know, you're going to stay here. A lot of times you have to kind of create your own uh, job or your own career. And so with that in mind, I started looking at other ideas and um, came up with the, with the wine tours. Now, what I like about your Sustainable Vine wine tours are that it seems like they're, you're, the whole company is very much in line with your values, mm-hmm. like about your biodiesel-powered Mercedes van. Mm-hmm. Are you one of the only wine touring companies that has one of those? As far as I know, uh, we're the only. Uh, you know, there aren't any other... Uh, green, you know, so to speak, uh, wine tours anywhere. So uh, you're the only 
green or sustainable wine tour as well as having a de- biodiesel powered van. Yes, yeah. That is a cr- incredible. Yeah. Well, well as far as I know, if, yeah. if there are, they don't have a uh, web presence, that's for sure. Why biodiesel in your van? Uh, well, you know, there's, there's the, you know, aspects of the fact that it's uh, domestic, you know, it doesn't come from overseas. It's uh, cleaner burning. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of, a lot of good things about biodiesel. You know, of course, it's not the, uh, you know, ultimate solution for everyone. It's just uh, one way that you can, you know, help alleviate uh, our, our addiction to, um, you know, fossil fuels. Was, was this van already converted to biodiesel when you got it? Great question. Um, actually, with the use of biodiesel, you don't need to do any sort of conversions with a diesel car. Really? Yes. Unless it is older than, I think, 1993, prior to 93, they were using uh, rubber fuel lines, which biodiesel is a huge solvent, so it can degrade those lines. So now all diesels are uh, using synthetic fuel lines. So if I had a, a diesel car or van before, made after 1993, I could actually power it up with biodiesel? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, you could just pull up to the pump and, and pump it in. Now, um, when you pull up to the pump with your biodiesel van, what are you actually pumping into your car? Uh r- Today, unfortunately, it was it was uh, petroleum diesel. Uh, the place that I had been going, uh, USA Gas on uh, on Carrillo and uh, San Andreas, just stopped selling biodiesel. Oh, terrible, yeah. Didn't apparently, they just have a big opening about it? They did, yeah. yeah, about a year ago. And apparently, from what I understand, they were purchased. That that chain was purchased by a larger chain, and um, they don't want to be involved with biodiesel at least at this point. Not not in the B ninety nine concentration. They they want to do, I think, a B5 eventually. But uh, What is the B? What is all that? The B stands for biodiesel. So whatever the number following the B is the percentage of biodiesel. So B5 would be 5% biodiesel, uh, B20, 20%, B99 is 99% diesel. And then what is the bio part of it? The bio part of it is the fact that it's made from um, uh, bio materials. Uh, in most cases in the U.S., it's made from soybeans. Uh, but you can make it from you know virtually any uh, vegetable oil. Uh, you can make it from animal fat. You can make it from even algae, which is uh, probably the most promising moving into the future because you get the biggest bang for your buck. With al- what, did you say algae? Algae, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you can farm algae uh, more efficiently and, and get more uh, more fuel per acre. I have yeah. I haven't heard of algae being yeah. used as a fuel. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, but the only problem with biodiesel is that it doesn't quite have the amount of energy that you have in petroleum diesel. So you'll experience slight uh, loss in in uh, power as well as um, efficiency miles per gallon. With my vehicle on on regular diesel, I get about 25 miles per gallon, so it's highly efficient. And with biodiesel, it's probably closer to 22 in that range. Well, we're going to take a short music break. And if you have a question for Brian during this music break, you can phone in to the studio at 805-893-2424. That's 805-893-2424, and we'll be back in a moment. And during the break, we had a few uh, callers, and one person, um, Brian, wanted to know more about your tours and how he would book a tour, when you do them, are they on the weekends, the weekdays? You wanted some clarity on that. Sure, yeah. Right now we're, we're kind of uh, in our slow uh, season. Uh, but yeah, we do tours uh, just about any time uh, we have people that are interested in going. Uh, we typically like to have at least four people um, for the tour to you know cut back on you know the amount of fuel you're using to kind of make it more sustainable. Uh, but uh, the tour includes your transportation uh, door-to-door. It includes all your tastings. It includes, uh, obviously, a knowledgeable guide. Uh, well, I don't know, but, and uh, the lunch, the picnic lunch. So it's uh, all inclusive. Um, but uh, yeah, right now, the weekends have been, have been uh, probably the most popular. Um, but we're, you know, year round uh, operation. And uh, other than the fact that we will be gone for a couple weeks during um, January. Okay, great. And if they wanted, um, if our, some of our listeners wanted to book a tour with you or get more information, where could they find that? They can go to uh, sustainablevine.com. Or they can give us a call at 805-698-3911. So that's 805-698-3911? That's it. 
great. And Brian, we did have, a, and we'll talk more. I want to hear more about the tours in depth, too. But we, I wanted to get to the um, second. We did have three callers. The second caller wanted to know if you, on any of the tours, have you noticed any permaculture happening? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that many of these growers are necessarily aware of permaculture. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly in line with what, what these people are doing. Uh, you know, they, part of biodynamics is really encouraging, you know, w- a closed system on your vineyard. So they don't want you to bring in outputs. Um, so they encourage you to have livestock, uh, you know, and, and basically do things uh, within a closed system. So you're not bringing things in. So I think that's, you know, pretty similar to permaculture in, in several ways. Um, but And also the, the um, cover crops. Uh-huh. Like having plants growing in the understory is a permaculture. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But, uh, no, I, I don't know of anyone who has, you know, a, a plot that they're doing in a Like integrated, in, right. Integrated, no. But, but uh, you know, one of the growers um, in the area, uh, Peter Work of Ampelos, uh, he's a huge uh, advocate of, of biodynamics, and he's been doing that since, uh, I think, 2006. And uh, one of the things that he's done is he's set aside areas along the perimeter of his vineyard so that when he does you know go through and and mow the cover crop it gives those beneficial insects a place to kind of go and hide uh, while you know this activity is going on in the vineyard so that they can then come back to the vineyard so great yeah and then he does owl boxes as well and um, you know he's he's a huge advocate of of trying to have these corridors or spaces that um, you know allow um, diversity and um, what what vineyard is he with? The he's with Ampelos. And is I think he's the one that I read. On, I think it was on your website or in an article where his quote was, "I wouldn't put synthetic chemicals in my morning coffee, so why would I want them in my wine?" Mm-hmm. And I thought that was great. So Brian, tell us a bit about what we would experience on these tours. I know you talked about that in the beginning, but maybe mm-hmm. a bit more in depth. Sure. Yeah, we we try and go to uh, locations uh, where you get a more personal experience. You know you. Where possible, we want you to, you know, meet the winemaker and, you know, get the experience of the vineyard. So, you know, we'll drive through various vineyards and kind of talk about the styles of agriculture and, you know, what they're doing specifically and, you know, the different aspects. And then we also try and get into wineries as well. So you actually see the process. You see, you know, what the winemakers are doing. You see the barreling. You see the, you know, during harvest is a, a wonderful time because there's so much activity going on. You know, everyone's pretty busy, so it's hard to, you know, get those personal experiences. But, um, you know, you really get a sense of, you know, the picking and the, and the processing. And, um, you know, we try and, we try and give you the best experience possible, obviously, but we try and kind of go behind the scenes to some extent and, and give you an experience that you wouldn't otherwise get, um, you know, maybe on another tour or if you were going to try and do it on your own. Plus, you have someone that's uh, designated. So Yeah, which is nice, yeah. huh? definitely. Yeah. And one thing, too, um, I was talking earlier about how your values really are all represented very well, your environmental values in this on this tour. Yeah, we, we try and have, uh, you know, a, a very consistent... Um, you know, message, obviously, it's, it's about sustainability uh, without, you know, cramming it down your throat, obviously. But we, you know, as a business, want to be the best business that we can. So we do things um, in a way that's consistent with our, with, our, with our philosophy. So, for example, you know, running the, the vehicle on biodiesel um, is huge. Uh, having a car that's highly efficient is huge. Uh, you know, we're members of 1% for the Planet, the organization that Yvonne Chouinard started, uh, where we give 1% of our revenue to local environmental organizations. Uh, our lunches come from New Frontiers, which is uh, a natural uh, market in the San Ynez Valley, where the sandwiches are you know, organic produce, uh, they, the meats and, and uh, the, you know, the ingredients are free-range and uh, you know, wild-caught, and um, you know, we try and be consistent with that. And, and by the way, we get compliments on every single lunch every tour there's always a compliment on the lunch because they do such a good job well all the write-ups i read about you online def- mention the lunch yeah, yeah huge huge very good um and then you know we we try and you know support all of these uh farmers that are farming sustainably you know it's a huge part to to educate people and to let them know okay this this is what you know some people are doing it's an alternative that that seems to work and, and be successful 
at least on the you know small scale of, of what these guys are doing. Do most people that sign up for your tour, are they already pretty aware and knowledgeable about this issue? Or have some people signed up not quite knowing what the difference between conventional and um, sustainable? It's a wine? totally mixed bag. That's a good question. Uh, we get people that are, you know, totally into it, that know a lot about sustainability, that want to learn about wine. And then we get people that, you know, know a lot about wine and, and are interested in, you know, some degree of sustainability. Uh, so it's, it's, and then we get people that don't even realize that they're on, uh, you know, uh, that, that don't even understand what sustainability is. So, you know, it's, it's a complete mixed bag, uh, but it's fun because, you know, by the end of the tour, you know, I try and do it in a way, you know, gauge people and, and, you know, if someone wants to know a lot, I'll tell them everything I know. But if it's, uh, you know, a group that maybe isn't as interested, I'll kind of slowly introduce them so that they they don't feel, you know, like they're being told that, you know, this is the way or, you know, it's, it's kind of a way that by the end of the tour, they're like, oh, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. I really, you know, understand and appreciate this, this new system that I've learned about. And probably seeing it firsthand and actually walking around, looking at the plants, mm -hmm. that would probably really be interesting to people as well. And I bet after the first wine tasting, mm -hmm. they get more interested or, or they, it just all sounds really great. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It, things start to be a lot easier after that first first stop but uh yeah and even you know some some of the people that aren't interested in sustainability the fact that we are you know meeting with the winemakers that we're going behind the scenes that you're getting an experience that you wouldn't otherwise get i think is is very um you know interesting to people people that wouldn't otherwise be you know as interested and what has the reaction been um from the winemakers involved in this tour they're highly supportive all of them they're you know engaged in similar uh, you know philosophy so they're you know all about sustainability and and doing what they feel is right so they've really been allies in in many regards because you know, we kind of share similarities in, in what we what we believe in uh, and and plus you know when I come on shows like this and talk about them that certainly doesn't hurt either yeah. so <laughs> definitely yeah. so Brian can you think of anything else that we um, have left out today you know, like a recap, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Tell us and maybe also give your contact information again as sure. well. Sure. So it's Sustainable Vine Wine Tours, and you can find us on the web at sustainablevine.com. Uh, the tours are 125 per person, and that includes your transportation, your tastings, and a picnic lunch that we typically do in a vineyard. Uh, the phone number is 805-698. 3911. And um, I guess, you know, by, by coming on a tour, uh, you're having a great experience and you're also supporting local organic biodynamic agriculture. You're supporting uh, local um, grocery stores. You're supporting local, you know, produce farmers. You're, you're giving a percentage or, you know, we're giving together a percentage of this uh, to local environmental organizations. Uh, you're, you're supporting a lot of industries that are trying to, you know, make this a better world. And you're supporting your local sustainable wine tour operator. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah, I really like the idea of we're so blessed in Santa Barbara to have local winemakers. Yeah. And then also we have, um, y you're supporting local environmental organizations. I didn't know 1% of the planet was actually you know, you could channel the money to local organizations. Sure. Yeah, there's a list of, of several different organizations. So well, that's there, great. there are many to choose from. Yeah, you're, you're not uh, told who to give to. So, you know, people like um, Heal the Ocean, uh, Channel Keeper, uh, Environmental Surf Rider, Invi yeah, EDC, CEC. I mean, there's, there's several that you can uh, donate to. So that is great. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. Thank you. And thanks for the growers that uh, allow me to have this job. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.